Grace Baptist Church. And uh, as I say pretty much every week, that portion of this ministry we refer to as Sunday school, a time for us to be schooled in the things of God. We look to the Lord to fill us, to open our minds and hearts to His wonderful truth. Before I get started into the message, I just want to give you a heads up. Uh, in two days, I go in for another total hip replacement. Uh, I pray that I won't be gone longer than two or three weeks from this pulpit. Please pray for me. Uh, this is uh, not a small thing, a hip replacement. Uh, just as the pastor had both of his replaced, uh, it's my turn. So I'm going to have those that uh, second hip replaced. And it's been a wonderful blessing. Thanks be to God for how he has dealt with me uh, in this. It's been a great help to uh, have these things fixed. Well, with no further ado there, let's get started today. The title of this message is The Greatest Curse. The greatest curse. Now, the message will end because I'm, because I'm going to, uh, it's going to end with me pointing out this greatest curse. And you may be a bit surprised, but when you hear it, I'm sure that you will agree with it. From the Holy Scriptures perspective, and that's what we need to be reliant upon, the Holy Scriptures perspective perspective, which reveal the mind of God, these holy scriptures, a curse is a pronouncement of judgment upon the soul who disobeys God. God demands obedience. I hope you heard that. He's not asking you. He's not suggesting that you obey him. God demands obedience to his law. And when I say that, we are specifically referring to the Ten Commandments. Galatians 3.10 says this, Cursed is everyone. Now, that doesn't leave anybody out. Cursed is everyone who does not continue a continual practice, who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. And when we hear that scripture, we need to realize as well that God demands perfection if you are going to attempt to live by the Ten Commandments. James 2.10 points something out that we need to realize. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one commandment, that one is guilty of all. Now, what does that mean pointedly? Well, pointedly it means... If you break one commandment one time in word, in thought, or deed, you fall short of the glory of God. And if you fall short of the glory of God, you, you are a sinner. 1 John 3, 4, we read this. The sin is the transgression, the violation of the law. Folks, we are all sinners. Indeed, we are born sinners. We come forth from the womb speaking lies. Find that in the Psalms. You always get this question then when we speak as we have spoken thus far. But what about those 
not having seen or ever heard of the Ten Commandments. Well, the Bible addresses that specifically. Romans chapter 2, beginning at verse 12, we see this. Listen up. For as many as have sinned without law, they don't know about the Ten Commandments, will also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. Friends, this is the Word of God, the Holy Scriptures. If you haven't heard the Ten Commandments, you're without the law, you will perish. And as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who do, who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and among themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. Now, the conscience is up and down in humanity, but we see this all the time when people realize somehow, and that's by the conscience, that they've done wrong. Sometimes they feel as if they've done right because their conscience excuses them. In the day, now that goes back to uh, the judgment of God, in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Earlier in Paul's very same letter to the Romans, to the Christians uh, in Rome, he made it very clear that human beings have a knowledge within themselves. We call that innate, if you will, that there is a supreme being, a divinity. People can deny that all day long, but it is the truth. The things in creation, seen in the heavens and on the earth, are evidence of this supreme being to the degree that humanity is without excuse to deny God. The creation reveals God to everybody. Paul uh, further states that human beings have innate knowledge, as I've said before, within them of having to face the judgment of this supreme being for their disobedient behavior. This is in every human being. They may deny it. Their conscience may become seared as with a hot iron, and they go ahead and they live lives of ungodliness. If you doubt what I've just said about the book of Romans, read Romans chapter 1, especially the last verse in that chapter, and you'll see that everything I just stated is true. Cursed is everyone. Repeating what we started with, cursed is everyone who do, does not do all things demanded in God's Ten Commandments. No exceptions, no excuses. And remember, you must do all these commandments all the time in word, what you say, in thought, in what you think, or imagine, and indeed, what you do. Realizing that, how is keeping the Ten Commandments perfectly working out for you? You are cursed, friends. You are cursed if you are a sinner. 
In 1 Kings 8.46, the Old Testament gives you a truth you better think about, you better consider, you better confront before you stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, the judge of the living and the dead at the last day. At that last day, there's no more time, there's no appeal, you can't change your mind then. It's judgment time. 1 Kings 8.46 There is no human being who does not sin. There is no human being who does not sin. Are you? Are you a human being? <laughs> I know in today's world, there are some people who say they're not really sure whether or not they're a human being. They don't know what their gender is. Uh, they may have no gender. But friends, in reality, if you are a human being, you are cursed. You are cursed. And once again, it would be timely for me to look back again and refresh ourselves as to what the word cursed means. If you are Cursed by God, you are condemned. You are doomed to torment. Doomed to torment. If left, it's very, very important, those two words. If left, if God leaves you alone in that position, you are faced with the most precarious Condition, precarious, big word, and we're going to consider this word precarious a bit more in a moment. This precarious condition is having no hope and without God in the world. Having no hope and without God in the world. Now, what does that, what does that mean? Well, friends, for the sinner... Without Christ, it means you have no expectation of good that is real. You may be looking at things uh, for the future, thinking you're going to go to heaven because you've done more good than bad. But folks, that's not a good expectation. It's not real. It's not true. God demands perfection. And it goes on, and you do not have a right relationship with with God. You do not have a right relationship with God. You are without God in the world. Indeed, if we read the scriptures closely, we see that those who have no right relationship with God are his enemies, are his enemies. Yes, unsaved sinners are in a most precarious condition. Now, we're going to deal with that word precarious, and it has a very fitting meaning in the case of the unsaved sinner. The unsaved sinner does not realize he or she is completely dependent upon and at the will and pleasure of of someone else. That's what the word precarious means. Completely dependent upon and at the will or pleasure of someone else. And of course, that someone else, in the case of the unsaved sinner, is God, who is the author of the law. God the Father and God the Son are that author. Why do I say that in the singular? Because Jesus Christ and his Father are one. They are one. I don't understand that. I don't know how that can be. But it is. That's the way that it is. The scriptures reveal that clearly. And I do believe it by the grace of God. But unregenerate, unregenerate sinners, sinners who have not yet been born again and are not spiritually minded, 
And that's what we're speaking about when we speak about being born again. They don't care. They don't care that they are completely dependent upon and at the will and pleasure of Almighty God. First of all, folks, they don't believe that. And then secondly, because of that, they don't care. Now, we're going to go back to Romans and read more in this area that I'm speaking of right now. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Excuse me. Looking at the wrong text there. We're going to look at... Got to find myself here, folks. Yes, Romans chapter 3 again. Verses 10 through... I have got the wrong... No, hey, yes, here we are. Here we are. <laughs> yes, sir. People who are preachers of the Word of God are human. And we sometimes uh, miss the mark here, but I'm on the mark now. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 18. As it is written, speaking now of sinners, there is none righteous. No, not one. Is that clear enough? None righteous. No, not one. There is none who understands. They are not spiritually minded. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. The word in the Old Testament there is filthy. There is none who does good. No, not one. Uh, again, I don't know how much more clear the scriptures can be. None. No, not one. Their throat is an open tomb or sepulcher. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. They have not known Christ. There is no fear of God before their eyes. They don't believe, they don't care, and they don't fear God. Yet, they are under the curse of the law. They don't believe, they don't care, they do not fear God, yet they are under the curse of the law. A most precarious place to be. But, what a wonderful word. B-U-T. But. But changes everything. And but changes the case for many sinners. But some of these unregenerate sinners get inwardly called by God. And then they discover they were completely dependent upon and at the will and pleasure of King Jesus. Would you believe we're going back? And I hope I'll turn to the right spot this time. We're going back to the letter to the Romans. Speaking of the sovereignty of God and the vessels of mercy. These unregenerate sinners who God calls to himself. Does not the potter have power over the clay? That's a simple question. Yes. He forms it into what he purposes to form it. From the same lump, 
to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor. But if God, wanting to show wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering, much patience, the vessels of wrath prepared for the destruction, that he might make known the riches of his glory on the, on the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory. Folks, that speaks of predestination. God has a purpose, and he's going to accomplish his purpose. Even us, the elect, whom he called, he called us by his spirit. He birthed us again from above. He regenerated us, even us whom he called inwardly, effectually, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. He calls all kinds of people to himself. Yes, God called us. If you're one of his people today, you know that. He called us in this new birth through the Spirit of Christ. The Spirit of Christ. We learn of Christ in the Holy Scriptures, and we find that he alone, as a human being, never committed sin. 1 Peter 2.22 speaks of Christ and nothing can be more pointed than what is said in four short words. Christ, and this is the scripture now, who did no sin. Who did no sin. As for Christ and the law, listen to this now. Folks, the law had a purpose. It must be fulfilled. It must be fulfilled. He fulfilled every jot and tittle of the law. You'll find that in Matthew 7, verses 17 and 18. And he made clear that the whole law had to be fulfilled. The prophets and the law had to be fulfilled. When it came to that law, folks, there was only one who could fulfill it, and that was Christ Jesus. He fulfilled every jot and tittle. To the smallest point, he fulfilled it all. In word, in thought, and deed, he did no sin, but fulfilled the Ten Commandments entirely, completely. Indeed, indeed, Christ is the end, the completion of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Not only was it the fulfillment of the law, but for those who believe in Christ, his righteousness in completing the law is imputed to them for their faith. And of course, Romans 4 11 makes that very clear. Now, the reference I gave you there for Christ is the end of the law is found in Romans 10.4. Romans 4.11, our faith in Christ. This is made so clear in this text. Our faith in Christ is accounted to us for righteousness. And an interesting little side note about our faith, which is the gift of God given to us in the new birth, that faith never comes without good works. Now, we don't do that perfectly, but we have an advocate who makes up for our imperfection, and we go to that advocate, even Jesus Christ, asking him to forgive us for our sins day by day, and the blood of Christ cleanses us, folks, from all sin. The blood of Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Christ 
is the end of the law for righteousness to us who believe. Our faith is accounted to us for righteousness. This message may prove to be a bit shorter than a number that I've been bringing here recently. But I want us to close now with our title, The Greatest Curse. I've not really addressed the greatest curse. We need to go to the book of Galatians and look to a text that we started with and then read further into that text. Galatians chapter 3, we're going to read verses 10 through 14. Folks, what is the greatest curse ever laid upon humanity? We're going to see it right here in the Scripture. For as many as are under the works, or excuse me, are of the works of the law, are under the curse. Plain and simple. For it is written... Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that, but that no one is justified by the law of God, excuse me, by the law, and this is according to God, folks, in the sight of God. No one is justified by the law in the sight of God. There are many people out there who think because I've done more good than I've done bad that I'm okay. No, no. In the sight of God, you have to do it perfectly. But that no one is justified by, by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by faith. That text taken from Habakkuk. Yet the law is not of faith. But the man who does them shall live by them. Now, I'd like to apply that. Boy, there, that, that, that right there is worth a long message. The man who does them shall live by them. What man did them and lived by them? Only one, and that was Jesus Christ, our Lord, our advocate, our substitute, the one who gives us his righteousness. And then it goes on, Christ, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Christ, with his blood and with his perfect, perfect life, has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Listen, having become a curse for us, folks, that is is the greatest curse by far. Nothing comes close to the curse laid upon Jesus Christ. Indeed, he became a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Folks, that's where he absorbed that curse became that curse and paid that price that redeemed us from the curse of the law. The cur Do you realize this, folks? The curse upon us all laid upon him. Indeed, he became that curse for his people. Now, why was that done? It's summed up in a bit of a different way here that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. That blessing, folks, of Abraham by faith, is that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, what is the promise of the Spirit? It is the Spirit of Christ in us, the expectation of glory. That sums it all up, doesn't it? 
Christ in us, this blessing, the expectation. Folks, you can expect to be glorified along with the Lord Jesus Christ at the last day. I end with this. This is the final thought. This is applied to you if you're a Christian. From being cursed to receiving the blessing of being united to Christ by His Holy Spirit. Oh, thanks be to God. Amen. And true.